everybody, it's Ryan. Welcome back to How Farms Work. Today we're standing at the bottom of my 24 acre cornfield. And I just got here, Travis did the outside two laps. Um, I had to go up to the Burton farm and help dad out. I took a tank of air up to him because the 82 had a flat tire. He's up there disking down uh, ahead of the planter. So that's where we're going next. But he had a flat tire. The tank of air that I took him wasn't enough to fill the tire up so we drove over to another farm and filled up all the tires in the front um, put them all at about 25 30 psi and hopefully that'll get us by just long enough to finish disking because that's the last farm and it's about 60 acres so we're standing here at the bottom of my no-till uh, cornfield what's going to be corn and we just sprayed burn down on this if you guys haven't seen that video already go check it out now um, this is no-till so one thing that we do struggle with in no-till is getting the seed down deep enough with corn we're aiming for about two inches deep and in some spots I just found a seed up on the end row up there uh, that was sticking out of the soil but with no-till the soil is harder so you have to put more pressure on the rows to get down to where you want and uh, with beans, you aim for around an inch and a half. Corn's a little bit deeper at two inches. So on this field, we're actually using seed from last year. Um, just to save a little bit of extra money, there were some extra bags laying around, and we said, sure, why not? As long as it was tested to germinate, um, we'll try it out. So I have to talk to Andrew here in a little bit, so I gotta go back to the main farm, but Travis is gonna keep going back and forth up on the top up there. Um, he's gonna use straight tracks to just go right across the field and it shouldn't take him hardly long at all. You can definitely tell looking at it that it is starting to turn to a lighter green as the plants are starting to die. But the waterways, um, I need to bring the broadcast seeder out, just a hand seeder, and spread some seed across there because we might have not burned off the waterways, but there wasn't good enough stand there to really justify calling them a waterway in some areas. I'm about to head up to Burton, which is the last farm that we are planning. Uh, I just loaded the truck up. We've got to go down to British Travis's place and get the tender. And then uh, we're going to head up. What kind of fertilizer are we putting down today? <laughs> uh, so uh, we've got riser as the main product. Uh, it's a 717-3 with micronutrients. And it's a product that I've fortunately been able to get now that we're a nutrient. Uh, we didn't have access to it before, so it's a nutrient exclusive product. But uh, I've watched uh, a lot of guys uh, use it. Um, some of the guys that are really going for the yield contest um, and some of those programs, they've had really good luck with it. Um, it's Riser 717 3 with micros, and what it does is it really enhances root growth. And a lot of the data shows that we get better success running really low rates of riser compared to higher rates of some other products like 624.6 or 1034.0, like what we've used in the past. So we're running two to two and a half gallons of riser. Uh, we've got a couple farms uh, that we have put accomplish in, uh, which accomplish is a um, basically a set of microbes um, that are going to help release soil nutrients and the fertilizer we put down and keep that available to the plant. And then Radiate, which is a product we've used in the past as well, radiates a plant growth regulator, stimulates uh, cell elongation, and probably one of the best products as far as a PGR product out there on the market. So uh, the guy who won the world record uh, corn yield last year, um, over 600 bushel, used uh, 10 different passes with Radiate on it. So, so the, that... I'd like to know his cost production on that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've seen some of the numbers on these guys that get, you know, that kind of yield, but um, uh, I, that particular example, he still made over $1,000 an acre on that yield. So, 
Uh, but a lot of it's, it goes back to management on knowing where we can push yield, where we can't push yield. You gotta look at how much money we're spending and what the return is. So if we spend money and we don't get a yield benefit out of it, there's no point in doing it. And when we look at five gallon rate of 624.6 versus a two gallon rate of riser, we're seeing better yields with the riser than the 624.6. We're using less product, which is environmentally friendly. Uh, we're seeing better results. So, and a very similar cost per acre on that. Okay. With 624.6, uh, we did have zinc in there, but we didn't have any other micronutrients. This is a fully loaded product. We'll be rolling corn by the end of this week. It's gonna be interesting because the forecasted low for Friday night's 28 degrees. Did so, they change it down again? They keep lowering it. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, so, but I'm not worried. The growing point of the corn's still gonna be in the ground. So it's not gonna be that big of a deal, uh, but we, I would fully expect to be able to row corn by Friday. Okay. Who's corn, our corn? How confident are uh, you in your abilities? <laughs> uh, there, I don't know about yours, but there will be corn up out of the ground, so. As far as planting beans first over corn, it's the second year we've done that. Last year we were kind of forced into it, and this year it was more of a decision to go ahead and do that. I mean, what what are the benefits of really planting beans before corn? You hear guys talk about it, guys switch back and forth between corn and beans. Why? Well, the biggest thing, like what you experienced last year, was the ground just was not fit for plant corn yet. The top inch was dry, but it was so saturated down below, and your your gauge wheels were getting muddy even going across there at the beans. But um, it gave, we had such short windows to try to get stuff planted last year. If we could go at all, then then we needed to do that. And that helped us out a lot. But the biggest thing is capturing sunlight with soybeans and getting that full growing season. We did go with a little bit earlier maturing uh, bean this year with a 2-0 bean um, across most of it. You've got a little bit of a 2-4 bean on a couple farms, but uh, no, I I like to see soybeans planted by May 1st. So if, if you're the guy that gets everything planted by right about now, you know, on a year like this year, it really doesn't make much of a difference because your planting window, you're getting everything done in about a week. But if it's a year where you get rained out a couple times and all of a sudden it's uh, June 1st when you're planting beans, that's when we start having issues with them coming out of the ground. You know, we've dealt with that in other years where you get uh, crusting on top. Um, you're pretty rare to get crusting on top planting them this early. So there's just, with beans, um, planting them early is pretty forgiving. Uh, corn we saw last year, there's a lot of late planted corn. Um, especially the farther south you went, that that still did really well, but the bean yields really dropped off as it got later last year. So, uh, no, it's, uh, you just gotta deal with what the weather gives you and what you got the opportunity for, and it's gonna change year to year on, on what's better to plant, beans or corn. So now Travis is gonna start planting the last farm, and then this is gonna be it for corn planting for us this year. Until replanting in about a week. <laughs> uh, I hope not. I just took over for dad. Uh, he worked last night, so he's pretty tired. So I'm working on, let's see what I'm working on here. This is the farm that we're on. I am currently up here. Light blue means it's hit once. Dark blue means it's hit twice. You can see over here that there's some lighter blue in there that I didn't hit twice. Um, as I got going, I did the first pass on what dad didn't do yet. And I look back and this was a known issue that it was getting loose, but let's go have a look. So I came over to this triangle piece on the other side of the hill because what I'm worried about is knowing the kids are luck. Since this is the last bit that we have to do, this last farm here, I'm afraid of something going wrong. So I figured I at least hit this chiseled ground over here once. So in the case that this gang actually breaks, then we won't have to not plant this until our next chance which is supposed to start raining tomorrow so we'll see but um this back gang back here there's a bar you can see this nut on the end of it so there's a bar on the inside of it and what that does is it it pretty much just holds all the discs together and you screw those nuts on makes the gang tight well what happens over time that we found with this disc is that that bar tends to stretch and it'll stretch and it'll become loose. You can see a little bit of wobble in there. It'll come loose. There you go. 
see that wobble? And when it stretches too much, it'll break. So I want to make sure that I at least hit everything once. And if, you know, it's not the end of the world, if this isn't all hit twice. But we've been going slow because this disc with the ribbons that it makes, uneven ground, have to go slower because the wings have a tendency to bounce because there's just not a lot of weight on them. And we're hitting it twice because it doesn't do a good enough job the first time around without the rolling baskets on the back. You can say we're kind of spoiled with the VT and the job that it does. Travis is currently planting behind me on that hillside, which is right over there. And I'm gonna do this twice, and then I'm gonna head back over here and hit this, and then I should be done. take these home and then mom's gonna run us back up so that we can get my truck the black truck with the tender and then Travis can drive the planter back now I put two little neat devices I put one on the 80 on the front weights of the 82 and one on the back rack of dad's truck and they're guardian angel devices that I got and uh, I don't know they're kind of neat little devices you can stick them on metal pretty much anywhere and you can't see his, but his looks pretty good on the back of his truck. At the speed that the 82 can drive, we'll get home in 25 minutes to half an hour or so. Well, that wraps up tillage. I just gotta hope that we can wrap up planting. Here's what we've got left. Here's what we've got done. We just packed up the planter. Travis is heading home. Dad's right behind him, and I'm right behind Dad. Well, we just got back to the farm. Travis pulled the 4640 back in the shed. It's now 12:30. 
We got done just before midnight on May the 4th. So that's pretty much it for this video. Thanks for watching guys. Be sure to check out all of our other videos. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat, all how farms work. And be sure to stay tuned as we continue through the summer. And I'll keep you guys posted on how the crop turns out this year. Thanks for watching.